reflection, both um, a, a reflection on you personally as to what where you are in the coaching process, and then you um, looking at the buildings that, that you're in and where they are um, in the process. And then um, Tina said that you had wanted to look a little bit more at, at PLCs and maybe um, role playing some scenarios. I mean, right. Right. Yeah. 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 it's not a PLC, but... Oh, oh, oh okay. Well, are, I think it is that will group work, be... Is that group working as a PLC? Um, the, group that, the, the group of teachers that you worked with? In multiple ways, yes. Okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely do that since, since, since you brought it, but um, we should have time here open-ended for, um, for any of the issues you, you want to address. Anything... Anything you want to be sure I squeeze into the schedule here? How about a, uh, should we take just a couple minutes and do a debrief on the reading piece? How many of you were here with the reading folks on site? Is everybody? Okay. So well, let's just debrief. I was kind of going to get to speed if somebody missed it. What did the conversations sound like? Because I had no time last night to debrief a whole group. I have, it's kind of an interesting, you know, I talked to one of, um, when I was a classroom teacher, I thought about how much I missed out on that reading, if that reading teacher would have been in my room, how much I missed out on learning from her. And so I made that comment to her prior to leaving, and she said, absolutely, but let's think about the other side too, that those students that aren't reading very well, will sometimes take more risks in my room, in the privacy of a group that's more like them, or has the same ability as them, than they would have in the whole room. So we would have had to make sure that it was still safe enough in the whole classroom setting for them to take those risks. And I hadn't even thought of that. I was just thinking of all the good things. I thought, yeah, that's, that's a side of it too, that sometimes those students, when they're pulled out, feel like they can take more risks or ask her to answer more questions. She's kind of an aha for me. I, it was really nice um, to have everyone together, our reading specialists, because we are trying to push in uh, all of our specialists into our rooms. And it's, it was very uncomfortable in the very beginning of the year for them to make that shift. Um, it still is a little bit, but it was it just kind of helped emphasize the importance and how everyone can benefit from that. Um, they didn't, but still, even if we walked away last night, you know, it was some of the things you're bringing about. Okay, we can see these these great benefits, and we're experiencing some of these benefits, but at the same time, there's still there's still that struggle because we haven't been at it. And, and what what what's the read on what the struggle is? Uh, they said that it was the distraction of that they're working with a small group, um, and if if one group is doing something that those students in that small group would prefer to be doing, it's hard for that reading specialist to keep them focused and on task. Um, or even little things like little Johnny's headphones where the volume was up too high, and so it's kind of like that squirrel effect, like you know, your group is focused on those little distractions. Um, you know, those minor things, some kind of management issues. The, the, the reason I was asking because what you want to do is get those things out on the table to be dealt with, so that that would be part of the team. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, how does the team address the issues? So it, it may mean that as a classroom teacher, I need to make some modifications in my, in my management or in my uh, design of my room in order to meet the needs. And I need to create, I need to create the sense for that reading specialist 
that this is her room at that time? It's not, you, you aren't coming into my room. We're working in our room. So that, that, that puts some pressure back on the, on the classroom teacher to make sure that she's creating that environment. It may even mean doing something with the kids. You know, it, it, no different than any co-teaching setting where you have to take time to explain to the kids what it is that's happening in that, in that co-teaching uh, uh, session and, and what your expectations are of the students as a community of learners in this, in this role. I think to me, um, the real eye-opener in our group, and, and we have excellent um, reading specialists in our building, but the law has always been a drawback for us in schools in that the vision was very limited. And so when you brought up the issue of them all being our children, how are we advancing everyone's reading? And then I addressed that question with our group and that was very interesting discussion because they never had considered all of them. And it's not a, a, a criticism, it really is the way they viewed the law. And so we did some out of the box thinking about, so how would it look if they all were and what, what pieces can you add that might strengthen the instruction for those borderline children for our classroom teachers. That was a really nice segue. Because I think as coaches, even though we don't do four and five, when we're invited in, most of us try to fill a need if they've requested it. But classroom teachers don't even think to ask a reading specialist because there have always been those boundaries drawn. So I think they feel uh, limited in that piece. And they want to honor the law and not get our school district in trouble. Mm -hmm. and in like manner, maybe it becomes a closed door, and we don't think about how what we do affects everyone. I think um, continuing to put up the individual franchise, the team, and the backwards planning, I don't think we can look at those enough. Because I think that every time those slides come up, the conversation is there. And and I think at this point, people have at least seen them once or twice. And so they're that feeling of, well, am I still where I was that first time I saw that? What, have I done anything to move? I don't think those have lost any power. It struck me that in almost every coach principal partnership meeting I've been in, you have reading improvement in the school goal. So it would seem to me just that component, just, just that statement in your goal would put uh, an incredible need for any reading specialists in your school to be on that team for that school-wide improvement. Whether it's serving as a resource to teachers who can use that knowledge and background that the, that the person has, whether it's the ability that they can be modeling strategies that the other teachers can be using. Um, but with that being in the school goal, it, it, that resource being overlooked. Um, you, you have any <coughs> questions for them based on <coughs> the, the conversations you and one of Lynette had and, and, and where you see going next? Well, um, Lynette is going to have reflection time at the next meeting where they're going to need to bring this back. So this isn't going to be, oh, we talked about this, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, and she sends out that agenda. And then I think as a group of coaches, too, you play a part in that because you're kind of that person to bring that administrator and 
reading teacher together. We had some administrators here last night, and that was really good. But, you know, just because of all the other things and lives, not everyone was here. So, you know, to kind of hold both parties accountable to that if the principal wasn't here, is that conversation happening about how to move forward with it? So as a, as a coach, if my principal wasn't here last night, I might want to request a meeting with the principal and the reading specialist, specialist. Mm -hmm. so that the two of you could share with the principal mm -hmm. the conversations that you had here and where those thoughts are. And then our next step is going to be, Steve, you know, kind of talked about reading behaviors. What, what are those behaviors that we want to see in those students? So then that's going to be one of the activities at the next reading meeting is to probably break up into groups and start talking about that. You know, what is it that we want to see students doing if they're fluent readers? Does any school have a good way of including the reading specialists at the PLCs to make them feel like they are part of the team? I know you do out of school day PLCs, so do your reading specialists come? Yeah, every specialist sits on one PLC pretty much, so even the library media specialists We'll sit on one of the PLC. So, like this morning, we had our, our special education teacher in on our early morning third grade PLC. So, Terry has kind of worked that out. And that, you know, for us, then yesterday, we provided that reinforcement of that foundation. And then our next step, but as, okay, we're in on these PLCs. And our reading specialists are like, yeah, these are all of our kids. We want to make sure that student at nine is, is also uh, making progress in the movie. So then we kind of talked about, well, it would be nice for the reading specialists and us to kind of have a time to share resources and things like that back and forth a little bit too. Because they want, they're hungry for more information. I think oh, that's powerful. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. I was gonna say I think that's powerful too because kind of our biggest struggle has been with our selection process and oh we've got kids going in and out and in and out and you know that's really okay but I my question has always been are we putting the scaffolds in place in the core instruction to make sure that those students stay up there and I think thinking about it this way, that they're all our kids. So even if they leave my Title I list, that legally I can only work with them, I can still check up on them. <laughs> and making sure that that teacher knows the strategies I used, put those into place in the classroom so that that student you know, doesn't dip back down. Because then if you're passing the students in the hallway, you can just, if you know what's going on, we share all of our PLC notes with all of our specialists, even the gym teachers, so that, and the music teachers, so that they can incorporate that learning within those grade levels into what they're doing as well. So it, and it's a work in progress. You know, really getting everyone on board and people not used to doing things that way. But, um, you know, we're starting to get, we'll start to get to the learning phase. We might feel a little stormy. <laughs> but, you know, it's a work in progress. So do you have your gym and music teacher also sitting on PLC or no? Yeah, our, um, our gym teacher sits in on our kindergarten PLC. Our music teacher did, but it just didn't work out for an after school. But she's very responsive to all the notes. I mean, simple things like we just created list listservs at every PLC. We took the time to make that listserv so the notes would just go out to to everybody. So even if they couldn't be there, um, and because we really want to breed that project-based learning environment to it, it was it is important that everyone is shared in the whole learning experience of every of what everyone's doing. I mean, it's in order to operate that way, it has to be yeah, almost have to. So. When our, our review, we have a special CG PLC as well at Northridge, um, which is nice. But then at our review time, um, through your coaching, um, they attend our intervention reviews. 
and I facilitate, but they do most of the talking with the general ed teachers. So we'll have you know the intervention group up, the kids listed, and then I listed the questions that kind of a discussion point questions, and um, you know how is it working? How do we all feel it's working? You know that kind of thing. So we then talk about progress, and then we just do the paperwork stuff. I just make an appointment and we just do it together outside of that PLC time. Um, I think that's one of the largest things I saw coming into Northridge is that everything was just separate. And, oh, they qualify for reading. You know, it's like when they say, oh, put their own an IP. I just let it go, you know. Um, I, I feel like sometimes I'm walking this little dance of being a liaison between general ed and the reading specialists where if they don't communicate, no, everyone's just going to be on the intervention forever and and we just keep doing the papers and following them away and, and nobody's making, not nobody, you know what I mean. Um, so I think that's just a big part of what I've tried to do. I don't know what, if it's working or not. At least we're talking about kids. Together. That's a start. Yeah. No, the push in thing is not happening. I, they would like it to happen. The problem is now we've actually, you know, it's just baby steps. Now we're actually having groups with the reading specialists that might not be even in the same grade level. So it might be like mixed grade level groups and really just groups on skills and gaps. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now, kind of experimenting with that. So, I mean, we could still push in, kids could walk to learn. Um, so it's kind of always in the back of our minds, but just getting mixed grade level groups, that's a pretty big deal. So. When you said they would like it, who's they? I think the reading specialists. The reading specialists would like Yeah, I think the ones that are in my school now, at Northridge, um, would, they wouldn't mind. And I, I think they have, we have a new reading specialist at our school and she has experience from prior, where she has um, pushed in, um, you know, but it, it comes back to she says, you know, sometimes you have a learner though that really needs to, they they need a more 